Okay, so we left off in part one talking about different types of exposures, and we focused on occupational exposure because that's one of the things we'll be at risk at uh, when we're performing injections as medical assistants. Wanted you to know a little bit about OSHA and their bloodborne pathogen standard. So OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They have a standard established in 1992 to help employers provide a safe and healthy work environment for employees. And the idea here is to reduce the risk of exposure to infectious diseases. So these standards are meant to keep us in our occupation safe. Standard precautions is kind of at the heart of it. It's issued by the CDC. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this because you can read through all of it yourself. And since you started the program, I'm sure you've heard about standard precautions many times. Um, I think in the next slide, it sums it up quite well. Um, the one thing you have to remember about standard precautions, and this summary is in that second paragraph here, under standard precautions, blood and certain body fluids of all patients are considered potentially infectious. And I will take that one step further. In the practice of standard precautions, and I, I actually mean this in the nicest possible way, although it doesn't sound that nice, anybody who walks through that door and into your exam room is potentially infectious. This is a concept that I think is easier to understand in the, in the age of COVID because we're all thinking that way, right? We should be at least when we're out in public. You know, am I, do I have proper PPE? Am I protecting myself from getting infection? Um, so in a way, kind of in the COVID age, all of us are potentially infectious, or at least we're more aware of it than we might have been, say, a year ago. And if you constantly remember that, you know, you protect yourself from the patient and any of their bodily fluids, especially in the medical setting, then you're right at the hub of what standard precautions are all about. Your first thought is going to be, do I need the glove? Do I need the mask? And what other protection may I need to have in this moment? It might also be making sure the door to the room is open, that there's proper ventilation. If you're going to be in a small, tight area with a patient for an extended amount of time, even with masks on in the COVID era, not a bad idea to keep ventilation good. It's been proven that uh, proper ventilation and space around people are two of the main things we can do to lower the COVID risk. And when it comes to standard precautions, gloving, hand washing, wearing masks when appropriate, and proper, proper safety measures, especially when handling sharps and anything involved with injections or phlebotomy, very carefully handling this material will prevent uh, the sort of uh, exposure incidents I mentioned earlier. Aseptic technique, we touched on it earlier. Let's go a little bit deeper. It's, uh, to define it, these are specific pra practices and procedures that we do under controlled conditions with the goal of minimizing contamination by pathogens. So it's not going to eliminate everything. That's called sterility. We can't do that to skin necessarily. Uh, there are different levels of aseptic technique. But the purpose that we have here is basically to maximize and maintain the asepsis or the absence of pathogenic microorganisms in the clinical setting. And the goal is to prevent infection for everyone, the patient and ourselves. There are engineering controls that are factored into this. So these are control measures that isolate or remove health hazards from the workplace to eliminate or minimize the risk of occupational exposure. So hand washing is going to minimize it. We know that's the number one way to prevent disease spread. Safe medical devices like the, uh, you know, the, the locks, the needle locks that are on the syringes we'll be using. You know, um, there's other types of devices we'll talk about this semester as well, but that's probably one of the primary ones. And you'll be using those locks in injections as well as phlebotomy. So get used to the various ones because you're going to be using them considerably. Sharps containers and biohazard bags, use them as needed. I think we said before, you know, the sharps in our classroom, the entire syringe, including the needle, it, with the device, safety device set, by the way, is dropped into the sharps container. If you have a little bit of blood that you're cleaning up, hopefully not in the classroom, but at the clinical site, for instance, sometimes a little blood gets out on the surface. You want to make sure you clean it up. And of course, you want to put as much uh, antiseptic on that area, appropriate antiseptic as possible, because remember, not all blood products are visible, and we want to make sure that the area is very clean, especially if blood has just gotten on it. Um, but my point to this is we have biohazard bags. If you have, say, a four by four with a spot of blood on it, that doesn't go in a biohazard bag. That's not a biohazard. That can go in the garbage. 
copious amounts of blood. So let's say you had a considerable amount and you have a paper towel that's kind of sopped with blood. That goes into a biohazard bag. But small amounts or small band-aids that have maybe have been over an immunization site, they don't need to go into a biohazard bag. As we discussed in the classroom, uh, destroying or uh, getting rid of these materials is very expensive. So we try to put only what's absolutely necessary in that sharps container. And for almost all clinical environments, the syringe is included. Uh, there's only a few exceptions where you might take a needle off a syringe, only a, under a direct order, never as re regular practice. Oops, I skipped a slide. Let me back up. Work practice controls. So uh, this, this is something we have to have awareness of in the work environment. We want to observe the biohazard warning labels. So understand what's labeled and what's not. Um, of course, before you have a cut or anything on your hand, you want to bandage it before you put your gloves on. So you want to protect before the glove goes on that area. Sanitize hands before and after each patient. Uh, there are some organizations that will require you to walk into an exam room and wash your hands in front of the patient at the sink before you put your gloves on and start your work. Um, and to be honest with you, if you have the time, it's always a good practice. I, I find it really impressive when medical personnel walk into a room and I'm the patient and they wash their hands before they glove up. It just makes it, 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 it gives a level of competence and instills a level of confidence in the patient that words can't really, can't really replace. That simple action of washing hands in front of a patient, it says, I really care about disease transmission and I really care about making sure you're safe. So that's a really good uh, tip that I've been given over the years. I've used it myself and it works really well. Uh, so sanitize those hands. Uh, a PPE, of course, we know that's important. Uh, we already talked about not uh, recapping or removing uh, or bending contaminated needles. We'll cover that more in lab. Dispose of any contaminated needles in a biohazard sharps container. Remember Ashley's advice, I really liked it. The minute you pull that needle out from the patient, you keep your eye on the needle until it's in the sharps container. Even when the safety is set, keep your eye on that needle and get rid of it as soon as possible and try to do it in a smooth way where you don't endanger yourself or anyone else. No food or drinks in refrigerators or freezers or cabinets or shelves or blood or any type of uh, medication or any type of anything that you're going to administer to patients. You want to make sure that there's no food combined with that. So to, to, to give you more detail on that, most immunizations and injections have to be refrigerated. So most clinics you work at that do these types of injections are going to have a designated refrigerator where you're going to be having those materials stored and you're not going to be putting food in, the, in that place. That's going to be for medication and the occupational uh, use of the medications only will go into those refrigerators. They'll have a separate one for you to put your personal items in. And of course, if an exposure occurs, you want to perform first aid measures immediately. And that's also be true. That's also will be true in the classroom, as Ashley had pointed out last last week in lab. Um, do the first aid first, then come and get one of us. So if the person's bleeding, just get pressure on that spot right away, and then we'll come deal with the situation. But first aid first. In the workplace, you'll go by the protocol that that workplace has told you they want you to, to follow. So they will have their own regulations and they'll tell you how they want you to go about it. Our infection control principles. So uh, MAs are always going to follow standard and universal precaution guidelines. So once again, back to the concept, every patient is potentially infectious. How will I protect myself? And in protecting myself, always keep in mind, I'm also protecting my patient. Uh, MAs are always going to use aseptic technique, hand hygiene before and after contact. Once again, that act, that simple act, even if it's hand sanitizer in front of a patient, it speaks volumes for your competency. It speaks volumes for how much you care about that patient's well-being. Uh, you, you have to know how to select a proper PPE and you have to be able to assess situations and what you're going to be exposed to. So, some situations, it might just be gloves. Sometimes it might be gloves and a face shield. Sometimes it's gloves, face shield, mask. Uh, if it's the case where, you know, like when we were in the hospital doing patients with potential COVID, we had to put on an entire, almost a biohazard suit with a special helmet called a capper, or sometimes they call pappers, depending on which system they're using. And that has its own airflow inside it. And so 
if we thought there was a COVID patient or they suspected COVID before we went in to do the chest x-ray, we put on this whole uniform, including the space helmet with its own air supply. So that's all forms of PPE. We assess it. They tell us there's a potential COVID patient in there. We know we're not going to, we, we know we're not going to go in with just gloves on, right? We're going to protect ourselves as best we can. And on the topic of gloves, you want to wear them when you're handling blood, body fluids, non-intact skin. It kind of in modern medicine right now, especially with the COVID situation, not to dwell on that too much, they're sort of advising you wear gloves all the time. So once again, that's specific to your facility. Uh, in our lab, we won't be wearing them to handle some things, but we will be wearing them when we do any type of injection, when we're handling any type of blood or bodily fluid. And anytime there's non-intact skin, you sh it should be covered. And remember, if it's, if it's like a cut or something that might bleed, the Band-Aid goes on first, then the gloves. Um, using sharps and the disposal guidelines. So we kind of covered this already. We sort of started it last week. We set those safety devices and they should be activated immediately after use. And we immediately put them in a sharps container and we keep our eye on the needle after we remove it from the patient until the device is placed in the sharps container safely. Um, sharps containers have to be leak proof, puncture resistant, and they're very, they're very specific. You've seen them already, so you're familiar with them. Um, we never, ever, ever recap a used needle. We do not bend, cut, or remove them from the syringe. There may be certain procedures and protocols later in your career where someone will have you do uh, maybe remove needles, but we will never do that in the classroom. You will never do that on your uh, externship. And generally speaking, we never do it unless it's a direct order from a physician. And um, so we're not even gonna enter into that protocol. As far as we're concerned, you're not gonna recap, bend, cut, or do anything with the needle on the syringe. You dispose the entire unit in the sharps container and it's gone. Uh, and of course, we want to pay attention to overfilling of sharps containers. They're very dangerous if they go over the fill line. The fill line is usually two thirds of the container. Um, it never is going to be all the way to the top. If you happen to be in a situation uh, as an extern where you see a sharps container is to the fill line, always bring it to the attention of who you're working with that day or who your designated person is who's teaching you that day. Um, always bring it to their attention. They may not have noticed it on a busy day, uh, but it is very important to let them know. Uh, how they act on it will be up to what the protocol is of that clinic. You can't really control that end of it, but you certainly, in a very kind way, could go up to uh, the medical assistant you're working with and say, I just noticed that Sharps container is up to the fill line. Is that something we should be concerned with? And uh, always bring it to the attention. All right, believe it or not, that was another 13 minutes. So we're gonna pause here and we're gonna come back with some more terms in part three that pertain to the idea of administering and performing injections.